Hello and welcome to this ISAMS training session. During this session, we're going to learn how to log in to the ISAMS system. We're going to learn how to navigate around that system. And we're going to learn how to use some of those important tools that you are going to need from ISAMS on a day to day basis. So logging in. ISAMS is a web based system. So that means that as long as you've got access to the Internet, the web address from the system and a web browser, you have access to ISAMS from anywhere in the world. OK, so if you need to log into the system from home, now you can. Your IT manager or data manager, whoever that is, will have shared with you the link to the ISAMS system. Some schools will save that as a shortcut on your desktop. OK, so you'll get a little ISAMS icon on your desktop. Other schools will save a link to ISAMS on a shared site, like a SharePoint site. Um, and other schools simply email round the web address to the ISAM system. Okay, depends on each school. Okay, the web address you actually can see at the top here. So on my system at the top, you can see the web address for my training system is highlighted up here. Okay, so as long as you've got that, you can type that into a web browser and you get into ISAMS. I'll just demonstrate that. So I'm using Edge, which is a type of web browser. And at the top, right up here in the URL, I can type the web address. One thing to watch out for is that ISAMS has a lot of pop ups. So some web browsers will block pop ups. OK, and you need to know how to deal with that. So I will demonstrate that now. So I type in my web address. Like so. Tap the enter key. And it's trying to open the website, but Edge is blocking it, saying there's a pop up. So I'm going to click OK. And then down the bottom here, I can actually say, always allow pop-ups from iSAMS. Once I've done that, on I go to the login page. Each web browser manages that slightly differently. OK, so for any of you who use Firefox or Chrome, what you'll get is a little red cross in the top right hand corner of this URL. You can click on it and you get the same message. Always allow pop-ups from ISAMS? Yes. And once you do that, you can refresh the page. You can do that by clicking on the URL, like so, tapping the Enter key, the page will refresh, and in you go. OK, so you only have to do that job once. Okay. It's also possible for your IT team to make ISAMS a trusted site across the network so that you never get that pop up when you're accessing ISAMS from within school. But it's no bad thing to know how to handle those pop up blockers just in case you're trying to log in from home. OK, so I'm going to go back to my original site, which is this one here. And I have my login page. Again, your data manager or your IT manager will have provided you with your login details. OK, so that will be your username or your password. OK. There are a number of schools that also opt for something called single sign on. What that means in layman's terms is that if you've logged into your emails, you'll get a button down the bottom that says log in with Office 365 or log in with Google. 
And so it would be a one button click and you go straight into the ISAM system without a username and password. Okay, uh, that's not all schools set that up. So your data manager or IT manager will be able to provide advice on if the school want to set that up uh, and if they have how to do that. So I'm just going to log in as if I had a normal username and password for the ISAM system. So I type in my username, my password, and then click sign in. Okay, so the page loads and you will come to a login screen that looks a bit like this. So that's it for the logging in. The next part of this training is how to navigate around the ISAM system. Everybody who logs into ISAMs comes to the same page when you log in. Okay, so it doesn't matter if you're the deputy head, the SENCO or a French teacher, you're going to come to a page that looks like this. You can break this page into three sections. So on the left hand side, this section is what we call the left module bar. Okay, left module bar on the left hand side. The middle of the page is the desktop. And it's designed to be a snapshot of relevant information about the current day at school. So if you are a teacher, you'll see a timetable. You can see the school calendar. You can see who else is logged in. So the joke here is if it's two o'clock in the morning on the day of the report writing deadline, you can see uh, which other colleagues are also logged into ISAMS at the same time, desperately writing the reports at the last minute. And then if I scroll down, there are a few other features like the daily bulletin or daily notices. So that will be notices about what's happening today at school. You can see a summary of all of the pupils as well who are out of school today. So that might be for school trips or it might be because they're ill. Either way, your out of school is a list of anyone who is not going to be in school today. So that's our desktop, middle of the page, snapshot of information about the current day at school. The third section is what we call the wizard bar. Okay, and this is really the teacher's toolkit. So 90% of the time that a teacher is using ISAMs, they're just going to go straight over to this wizard bar on the right hand side. When you first log into ISAM, some of you might find you can't see that. So up here, you will notice there's a little icon. And if I click on the little arrow, that allows me to undock or dock the wizard bar. So for anybody who's not a teacher, you're going to be more likely to go left. And if you are a teacher, you're more likely to go right. OK, so the idea is you can open and close that wizard bar. If you don't need it, if you're viewing it, I stand on a very tiny screen and you're not using the wizard bar, it can be quite helpful to just temporarily close off the wizard bar to give you a bit more space. Okay. So during the course of this training, I'm going to show you some of my favorite tools that are available from within the wizard bar. Okay. The most important ones you're going to need on day one. However, I would encourage you to be curious about what else you can do in that wizard bar. 
it's pretty bulletproof, uh, teacher proof. Um, you really can't do much damage from here. So have a little look around that wizard bar to see what's in there. I'm going to show you some of the most important functions, but there's some pretty other, pretty cool stuff in there that might be useful um, to you as well. So I encourage curiosity to find out what else you can do in that wizard bar. Okay, so the first and most obvious is I need to take a register. Day one, you've opened the ISAM system, you've logged in, and you need to do a register. So if I look down this wizard bar, I can see there is a school registration. So if I open that subheading and then scroll a bit, I can take a registration. So I can click on that. And here's one of those pop-ups that I talked about. Okay. If you are viewing the registers at the correct time, i.e. when you're supposed to be taking them, then ISAMS will present to you the group of students you are supposed to be registering right now. Okay. I don't have anyone that I'm supposed to be registering right now. Um, so what I can do, uh, the most common reason you'd be doing this is if you've missed your registration and you need to go back and do it afterwards. So what you can do is you can click on that registration time drop down and you can choose which register you want to take. You can choose which group. In this case, it's defaulted to the little tots group, which is my form group or my class. So I click go. And it will present me the register. Okay. Um, you may have noticed the flashing note at the top here. So that tells me that there's some information that I need to read out to either this whole class or certain individuals. So it said a big flashing box that there's some information in here. So I'm not going to ignore the flashing box. I'm actually going to click on it. And here's the note, so I can click on that. The note is for Zane Abbott. And he left his football kit at home and mum has dropped it off in reception. So at the point that I would be taking the register, I'd say, hey, Zane, you, after class, go to reception, get your football kit. Okay. Saves the admin team from running all the way around the school trying to hand deliver notes. I can click on the note and say save. OK, and then close my pop up down, either close here or close up the top. And you see the note is gone. If you don't mark the note as delivered, it will show up in the next register and the next register and the next register until Zane gets his information about his football kit okay imagine it was lunch you know his lunch is in reception okay so he's going to go hungry if he doesn't get his sandwiches so the note will keep appearing in the register until someone has actually delivered it and the note will expire when it's no longer needed so his dry curly sandwiches are of no use to him tomorrow so that note will stop appearing in the register the next day OK, so if I go full screen and look at this, you've got the names of the pupils. You've got some nationality flags. I have some health flags here. So. Whether this shows on your registers is really up to the school to put the data in the system. Um, uh, the idea is that it's it's reminding you about those pupils that have serious health conditions that you need to be aware of in this lesson. So if I was covering this class, maybe I don't know that Zane has got quite serious asthma, for example, or that I have a type one diabetic in the class. OK, so if you hover over those notes, it does actually show you 
um, a bit of information about that pupil's medical conditions. For, from a safeguarding perspective, it's actually very important to have that kind of information. However, it does mean that you must not present the registers onto your whiteboards. Okay, so on here, I can see Zane has a health condition and that Arabella has an SEN flag. So she has some special educational needs, additional learning, whatever you've called it. So please don't present the register onto your whiteboard. Even if they don't see the note, kids will be able to see those flags and those stars if you present this on the whiteboard. Okay. Something to be careful of. You've also then got possibly this extra flag. Now, not all schools go for this. It's a well-being flag. So if there's something about um, kind of pastoral, so maybe there's been a family tragedy and Zane is going to be pretty emotional. Um, I kind of need to know that if I'm teaching him. Um, so you have the opportunity to put those flags into the registers as well. You can click on the name of the pupil and it will give you a photograph, some information about their health, SEN and contact details. Okay. So that's the kind of information that's available from the register. In reality, what you're going to do in here is you're just going to go click all present and then no, no, no for people that are not in. If you know why a pupil is not in school today, then you can click on the reason drop down and say, hmm, he's at a medical appointment. I did know about that. Again, this is a piece of functionality that not all schools switch on. So don't panic if you haven't got this. The alerts are for the, um, it's an additional email to either the attendance officer or a safeguarding lead to let them know that Caitlin is not in school today. So of course they'll find out by running reports on who's not in school today, but maybe somebody, there's certain key individuals in the school that you need to act immediately. Um, the Sheikh's daughter or something, or um, there's an individual with um, kind of complicated family um, situation and somebody basically needs to ring mum or dad to find out where that child is as soon as it becomes apparent they're not in school. There's a whole range of reasons. Okay, so you don't always need to click that. It's just for those kind of important cases where you know that actually, if this person isn't in school, somebody's got to do something about it now. If somebody's late, you can tick to say that they're late. And you can either say, it's either that, you just say that they're late, you could potentially say what time they arrived. And there's another option that gives you, right, well, they're five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes late. You actually select from a drop down. Um, it's up to the school to decide how they want to report on lateness. If Arabella is always late, I know she's going to turn up, but she's just not here yet. Okay. You do not mark her as either present or late until you see her in front of you. OK, so if Arabella has missed form time, she's not been in your classroom for form time, then the correct thing to do is to mark her as absent with no reason provided. OK, those N codes are not a bad thing your school office will be able to 
see the list of all of the pupils registered absent with no reason provided and then they will find out where is that kid if Arabella is kind of missed the bus again and turns up for school half an hour late she will have to sign in at reception okay and reception will update that N code to be a late after registers close so essentially don't leave them unregistered don't mark them late or present because you know that they're probably going to turn up in 10 minutes time mark them absent with no reason provided and then the school office will update the information to find out you know either if they're completely absent why and then if they were late then it will be updated by them okay um if Oscar walked into your form time you know, two minutes before it closes, it's OK to use the late button. You might use the green plus button to say, why is he late? So bus broke down. OK, and then you can click on it again to close that. For any of you that have used Google Sheets, you'll know it does that unnerving thing where it just saves as you go along and you don't have to press save. Registers is the one and only place in the ISAM system that behaves like that. Everywhere else in the ISAM system, there are save buttons. OK, so if you watch the screen, I'm going to update some information. And you'll see it's got a little message that says, please don't close this page. And after a second, two seconds, that data is saved and it's now safe for me to close my register. And that's it. That's taking a register. OK, so just to recap, it's the wizard bar, school registrations, take a registration. I choose what time I'm registering and what group. Click go. All present, absent, absent. And if I know why they're absent, put a reason in, breathe, give it a second to save. And then when it's done, I can close the pop up. If you feel like it's taking too long, there is a force save button here, but I would encourage you just to have a little bit of patience with the register. If we all click that force save button, we found that it can sometimes um, create a little bit of a slowdown in the system. So if you can just be a little bit patient, let the register save in its own time, that's generally best. So that's registers. The next obvious one is timetable. So I'm going to close up that little subheading and I'm going to go to my link up here, which is the 2018-19 timetable. So if I want to see what I'm teaching, I can go to get teacher timetable. Click on the drop down and find my name in the list. You have a range of options, so you can view the timetable on the screen. You can have it as a PDF. For any of you who rely on your calendars, be that Google Calendar or Outlook, you actually can export your timetable as an iCal format. So what that means is it exports in a format that you can then import to your calendar. So if you're in the senior leadership team, you've got quite a lot of meetings that happen during the week, you can actually have your whole school, you know, school timetable overlaid in your Outlook calendar along with all of your meetings. OK, so that's quite that's quite a helpful one. You can also email the calendar, the timetable, sorry, to 
other individuals. So imagine you're doing a get student timetable. You've got that kid that's constantly late to your lessons um, who claims that they keep losing their timetable. Well, you can email it to them as an attachment. Okay. So you've chosen how you want to see your timetable and you click next. Okay. So that's my timetable grid. You can see the lessons that I'm teaching. Blue is the current day. Orange is the current period. So if somebody said, you know, where is Faisal right now, then you could actually look at the timetable and it would actually highlight exactly where that teacher or student was supposed to be. Some schools run multiple timetables. So if you've got a prep school or a junior school that have a timetable, um, there it is possible to have multiple timetable grids available within this pop up as well. You can print the timetable using that print view button in the bottom left hand corner. And there you go, you can print it. The other pretty cool thing you can do with a timetable, one of the reasons you'd be looking at it is I need, let's imagine I'm a biology teacher. Uh, we do BTEC at the school and I want to have a moderation meeting. So I want my three biology teachers off timetable at the same time so that we can have a meeting. OK, so we're going to have a meeting about coursework marking to make sure that we are all using the same standards. So I don't want to look at each teacher's timetable one at a time. I can use my locate objects and periods. OK, so I'm going to start off by object which allows me to find when a teacher or combination of teachers are free. So I'm going to click on that. And you've got a list of teachers here, so I'm going to find myself. And I'm going to find somebody else as well. So let's go for Miss Jones. Now, it's no good having just me or just Ellie. I need both of us. So I return only the periods where all of the selected objects are free. So that's something of a reflection of our developers' people skills. Uh, by object, they mean teacher. And then we're going to say next. And we can see that uh, in the senior school week, we're not free ever at the same time. So you may find that that is a problem that you share at your school. Um, but anyway, so that does actually run a comparison of our timetables to see when we're both off at the same time. Let's say that I'd actually found a period here. Period three on a Monday. And now I need a room. So I'd like to find a room that's probably free. So I could now go back. And this time. I'm going to find a room. By period, so let's say Monday period three. So it's the senior school week, Monday period three. This was going to be a really long meeting. I can hold the control key down on my keyboard. And I can select both period three and period four. And then I tick only return records or rooms that are free for both period three and period four. Click next. And it's going to suggest a free room. Okay. Um, if you have 
a junior school or a prep school and a senior school, it's helpful to have a um, like prep school PS in front of the room names here so that you don't end up accidentally uh, booking the prep school staff room for your biology coursework meeting. As for the actual booking of this, ISAMS isn't a room booking system. So you probably have a calendar somewhere or you might have an actual room booking system. So having used this functionality, you would then go put the booking into whatever system you have been using up until now. Behaviour. So we group behaviour under the rewards and conduct section. The important thing to say about this section is that it's highly customizable. So in a junior school, rather than having demerits, you might find that you have thunderclouds and rainbows, or you might have head teacher's commendations or certificates. It's entirely up to your school's pastoral team to decide how we are recording negative behaviour or reinforcing positive behaviour using the rewards and conduct. OK, so don't don't worry that you're not going to see the same exactly the same list in here. So let's imagine I wanted to give a merit so I can click on the merit. I can either do this one at a time or for the whole class. I will show you both. One at a time, super easy. You just say add a new record, click next. It knows who I am because that's who's logged into the system. So all I have to do is pick a student. So let's find Zane Abbott. It knows what date it is. So if you were doing this retrospectively, then you could choose a date in the past. And then you have your categories. So in this case, when I award a merit, it's either a bronze, diamond, gold, silver. Again, very customizable up to your pastoral team, what's in these drop downs. So I'm going to give him a bronze certificate for holding a door open. OK, some schools also opt to have another drop down in here. Don't be surprised if you don't see that in yours. In this case, for me, I think it's enough to know that somebody's had a merit and it's a bronze. OK, um, there are potentially other options that would give you something like it's a uniform error and then you would say what was what was missing so no tie no blazer shirt untucked okay so you've got those kind of other options the idea of this third bit down here is that it saves you having to write shirt untucked up here okay take means that the whole thing would take longer to enter all right so if i click next now and then finish we're done Simple as that. The next one then, how to give the whole class a, a merit. So same process. I'm going to click on my wizard bar. So I've got my merits over here. And I can add multiple records in one go. OK, so this is where I want to do the whole class. Click next. OK, so again, it knows who I am. You can choose to award forms or classes, homerooms if you're IB school. You can do teaching sets, whole year groups, boarding houses, whichever groups apply to your school. So in this case, I'm going to have a form class. My group, the little tots. OK, so you've got a list of all of the pupils here. And I fill out the top line and it will copy down. OK, so my reward category in this case is going to be gold. 
Okay, it warns me that's going to copy the information down. That's totally fine. And you can see having filled that out, it's copied all the way down the group. I can give a description. Descriptions are nice. They tell us why has someone, you know, gives you a little bit more information. Um, so in this case, um, I'm going to say it was fantastic um, behavior on the school trip. Okay. If I just click away, so in this gray area, again, it warns me, should I copy down? You say yes, and you've copied this down. I still haven't actually given anyone a gold star yet because I've got to click the plus icon and now you can see everybody gets a gold star apart from I can take one away apart from Oscar he was a little rat bag and so was Caitlin so they're not getting a gold star that's it click next and then it gets to the next page we'll click finish done behavior types one thing i would say about putting information into the rewards and conduct is that you should not write anything that you wouldn't say to a parent's face the school can choose to publish this information onto the parent portal or the parent app. So parents love that. They love to know that their kid has got a gold star for being absolutely lovely and holding a door open. Um, but bear in mind, you can also put negatives in here. So if you're giving somebody a demerit for persistently disrupting the class by trying to braid the little girl's hair in front of her, um, then what? bear in mind that this information is or can be made available on the parent portal. And it is also can be emailed to form tutors, heads of year, head of pastoral, that kind of thing. Okay. At this point, probably if you've got a head of pastoral or someone who's actually set this up in the room, then they will be able to advise you on whether or not that's being shared with parents um, and who gets the email alerts when this kind of behavior is put in. So, it's just a generally a golden rule to stick to. Don't write anything in here that you wouldn't say to the parent's face. Okay. There are other tools like under the communication tools. Here's another scenario that you're going to need help with. What's that parent's phone number? So you know, Caitlin keeps disrupting the class and she's really disorganized. I actually, I'm not going to put it in a reward and conduct that then goes on the portal. I'm actually going to pick up the phone and speak to the parent. Okay. So in this circumstance, I need Caitlin's mum's phone number. So how do I find that? So it's under the communication tools, student quick view, and I can type the name of the pupil. There she is, Caitlin. And I can go to the contact details. And here we've got her parents' contact details. You need to know who's the right person to ring in this circumstance. So there are probably three easy ways for you to identify this. So the first and simplest is that the yellow star next to a contact means that's where the child lives. So there's a good chance that you should be ringing the person the child lives with. Um, the second is that if there is more than one contact, then they will be um, organized in a list. OK, so your admin team should be organizing your primary contacts to appear at the top of the list. 
The third and actually most important is this one here. So it tells you if it says all, then this contact is supposed to receive all communication. So go ahead, ring either of them. It's absolutely fine. If you see a red cross next to it, big surprise, you don't contact that person. That might be um, a, an auntie that lives around the, you know, around the corner. You can pick the kids up in an emergency. It might be a, a nanny or a babysitter. So, um, so if it says all, then you can contact either of them. And if it's a red cross, then you're not going to be contacting that person. So those are the three. Yellow star, top of the list, all, all merges. This is an optional extra. So it may not be being put in by your admin team, but it is also possible to put contact notes in here. So that gives you information specifically about this family. So maybe mum is a doctor who works nights. So unless it's an emergency, can you try to drop her an email or ring her husband first rather than ringing her because she might be sleeping off a night shift, for example? or a, a divorced family where dad has said, you absolutely must always ring me for permission about everything, not just mum. Okay, so certainly if there's any kind of, anything that might trip you up or you might go wrong about, it's helpful if your admin team, if they receive that information from the parents, which would be fair to say they don't always get that information, but if they do, then it's helpful to have that in the contact notes. There's also a little attendance summary here. Um, so that will give you a summary of their attendance today, this week, this term. So you can see that here. So in my training system, we have absolutely atrocious attendance. Um, but it gives you a little bit of a breakdown there. And then I can close my pop-up. Okay. So I hope that I'm demonstrating that that wizard bar and that kind of day to day teacher usage of the system is, is kind of really the first place to start looking for, for what you're after. Generally speaking, the left hand side over here is for people who have um, other responsibilities. So if you were the um, admissions registrar, you'd have the admissions module over here. Or if you were the deputy head academic and you write the timetable, you would have a timetable module over here. So you can choose which modules you want to have as your favorites or quick links. To do that, you would click on the little waffle icon here at the top. So if I click on that, it gives me a list of all of the modules that I have access to. Now, I am logged in as an administrator to this system. So you're not going to have this many modules. Okay, very few people have this many modules when they log into ISAMS. Okay, so Everybody who logs into ISAMS has a security profile linked to their account. That security profile grants them access to modules or not, depending on their job role at the school. So if you are the admissions registrar, congratulations, you're going to have access to the admissions module. If you are not the accountant, you are not going to have access to the fee billing or invoicing module. So that should already have been set up by the time we come to do this training. If you feel that you are missing something that you need to do your job, then don't suffer in silence tell somebody about it. Now that is going to be your IT department, most likely someone ought to stand up right now and say whose responsibility or what email address you're supposed to send any questions through to. OK, 
Okay. But if you've not got something on here that you think you should, um, don't suffer in silence or just think, oh, well, that's it. It can't do that. It may just be that you haven't been given access. So email your IT department or other relevant individuals and check. I can make these modules a favorite by clicking on the little star. So at this point, you would need to go through and choose your favorites. For teachers, I can tell you now that that is going to be the pupil profile module. So I'm going to scroll down and find that. So I want pupil profile and I'm going to click the star to make that my favorite. I'm going to want the um, reporting. So yours may be called reports wizard and the online assessment system or OAS, which is over here. I've renamed mine to assessments. So I need to be able to write reports. I need the pupil profile. And to be honest, as a starting point, that's probably good enough. So if I now click back on my little waffle, you can see it's now added those modules to my left module bar. If I click on my pupil profile, you will see the module will launch in the middle of the page over that desktop. Pupil profile I have picked deliberately because it is the academic hub for pupil, for data about your pupils. So if I was planning an, in, an intervention meeting with a parent or I was preparing for a parent's evening or writing a report about my, my form duties, for example, I would probably go into the pupil profile and actually get their, their names up. So you can search by school structure. So you can search for, see these search buttons at the top. So you could search by form group. Or if I just go back to that pupil search button, I can search for a name. So if we look for Abbott, all or part of the name, you don't need the whole name. And then click on the pupil name to open the record. Okay. So again, I've got my health information. I've got my pastoral flag, photo. And then over here in this right menu bar, you can see a whole summary of really useful information. So registration or attendance information, what extracurricular activities does Zane take? What subjects does he take? Is he dyslexic? Um, has he been in detention? What's his behavior been like? What did I say about him uh, last year in his reports? Or what did somebody else say about him last year in his reports? What are his exam results like? And then ultimately there is student tracking. Now, anybody listening to this recording is at the initial first stages of setting ISAMs up and very unlikely to have the tracking set up already. OK, so at some point, once the school become more confident in using the ISAM system, then you may well find the student tracking uh, is a place where you can see what was somebody's predicted grade, what they're working at level um, and are they kind of on target meeting or below. OK, so that's kind of as you would expect, kind of academic tracking. And that's it. So a module can be minimized or closed. If I minimize it, you'll notice that it's just down the bottom here. OK, so anytime I want to open that up again, I can click on that blue icon at the bottom and it will reopen my module. OK, I'm going to open another one like assessments. And of course, the module has opened in the middle 
and it's now created a little tile down the bottom. It's exactly like browser tabs on Chrome or Firefox. Okay, so if you, you've got the whole browser session, and then if you're using Chrome and you're looking at the news, the sport and the weather, then you'd have a bunch of tabs across the top. The modules in ISAMS is exactly the same. You open a module like this, except that the tabs are down the bottom. When you're ready, you can close a module and that will bring you back to your desktop. So that's really the basics. That's kind of what you need to know to get you started on the first day. Um, actually two more things from the wizard bar and then that is really all you need. So under school lists, you might want to print a set list. So including the photos of all of your kids. So if I could go to my form lists, my little tots group, You're kind of building a report here, so you can include as much or as little information as you want. So I don't care what house they're in. I know what year group they're in. Don't need the house code. I probably do want their preferred name and maybe their date of birth as well. Okay, so that's what I want on my report. You can choose what you want on yours. I can click next. I can view it on screen. And I can also have a photo gallery. So that's quite nice if you don't actually know who all of your uh, tutees or, or pupils are. I click next. And that gives me a list of names, preferred names, date of birth, and then photos. Okay, and then I can close that. It is possible to print these and it is it possible to download data into Excel and PDF and things like that, uh, not only from the school lists, but from other places in ISAMS. I will reiterate a message you have no doubt heard before, which is that if you don't have to download it from the system, it really is better not to be downloading this data onto your personal devices, onto your laptops. Um, as soon as you take the data out of the system, you greatly increase the risk of you lo losing it. Um, so the safest way to make sure that you don't end up losing sensitive data from the system is to not download it from the system in the first place. Remember, this system is web based. You can access it from anywhere. OK, so you can log in from anywhere in order to find this information. Okay. For those schools who also have the iTeacher app, it is possible to access iSAMS from an app on your phone um, and your IT team will be able to give you the information about that if your school have that app. Not all schools do. And last but not least was the communication tools, was the contact students teachers. So in this case, um, we're trying to reduce the all staff emails. So imagine that um, Zane's goldfish died. He is very sad. Be nice. So People in school need to know that he's going to be a bit weepy and unhappy today. So we need to just kind of support him maybe or understand, you know, if he goes, um, has a bit of a meltdown, then you've got some idea why. Hopefully no need for an email attachment on that one, but you know, other circumstances you may need to attach to this email. And then you have your students. So I can search for Abbott again, click on his name. And then I click the green plus. It may happen that Ethan, his brother, is actually very sad about the goldfish dying too. Okay, so I can actually include 
ad hoc other pupils to this list. You know, a group of 10 year olds who were you know, part of a friendship group and there's been a major falling out in the friendship group that you need to know about. So don't just assume they're going to sit next to each other, something like that. So you can choose who is involved, use that plus and add them to the list. And then here's the time saving. So recipients, I don't want to have to look at Zane and Ethan's timetable, find every single person that is going to teach him today, find their email addresses and then email them as a specific group. It will take me ages. And that is why lots of schools end up with these all staff emails going around with sometimes quite sensitive information, which is largely not relevant to the majority of people at school. OK, so by using the contact students, teachers, you are emailing just the people who are going to see Zane. So it might be either all of Zane's teachers and ISAND knows who's that, who that is because it holds the timetable. This might be an academic concern, so I want to email it to the head of subjects. It might be the form tutor. And it is actually possible to have custom email addresses here. So it might be that you want it to go to the nurse or the matron. Or you could have a, a safeguarding or pastoral team that's noted in here. And if I go to my email options, you can see the email appears to have come from my email address. This is quite important. Emails go out from ISAMS, but they don't come back in. So when if someone were to respond to this email, it's going to come back to your Outlook or your Google email. OK, however, a record that you have sent this email is actually stored in ISAMS. And that is where you, you know, that's kind of why you would bother to, to send it from ISAMS in the first place. One, it's quicker to find the people you're going to need to email without having to send an all staff email and it's actually recorded on the email history. So rather than having five separate emails that have gone out from separate people's inboxes, you have one place where you can see all of the information or emails that have been sent from ISAMS, um, which does make it a bit easier to start spotting patterns and trends in a pupil's uh, academic achievement or well-being. So I can confirm those recipients. OK, so I don't want to send it to Lynn. She didn't need to know. Wendy doesn't actually need to know. It's just Helen, Andy, Charlotte and not these people as well. So you've got another opportunity to check that those are the right people. And then you click confirm and send. I have actually switched email sending off from my system. But what this does demonstrate is that it gives you a delivery status report. So from your systems, I would hope that that would say, great, I've sent it to these people. And it gives you a message if it was not able to send the email from from your system. OK, again, I've actually switched all emails off from this system, um, which is why those have bounced. So we're coming to the end of the training session now. So to recap what we've learned, we know how to find the system by either clicking a shortcut or using the system URL, which is at the top. We know that we have to put a username and password in to log into the system. We know about navigating. So we've got the left module bar, desktop and wizard bar. We have gone through the most important tools that you're likely to use on day one from the wizard bar. And you know how to access modules. And favorite the ones you think you're likely to use most often. So all that remains really is to talk about logging out of the system um, and another reminder about keeping your information and your data secure. So I'm sure you've heard plenty about this already. Um, always log out of the system when you're done. So this little kind of, I guess it looks like leaving a door button. 
So that is allows you to log out. If you close it down, though, that will actually also log out as well. So you can log out of the system this way. And that's it. We are out of the ISAM system. Please do not share your usernames and passwords with anybody else. OK, uh, responsibility for not losing data from the system rests with you as individuals to protect your usernames and passwords. If you share your passwords, with a colleague, if you stick it on a post-it note next to your computer, you are responsible if data goes missing from the system. Okay, I'd love to say that it's not happened, but it, it can. Um, so please, please don't share your passwords. Um, don't write them on post-it notes and stick them up next to your computers. There is a lot of information in this ISAM system. Uh, behavioral information, contact details, photos, you name it. So just by making sure that we're being careful with our passwords and that we make sure we log out of the system when we're done, um, we, can, uh, we can do our bit for making sure we keep that data secure. So thank you very much for your time taken to listen to this. Um, and uh, that concludes our training session. Thank you very much.